Morning, everybody. David Shapiro here with another, uh, another sorry, I can speak, I promise, um, brief uh, research update. So I've got um, three microservices working. Um, we've got the simulation microservice, which I've been detailing over the last few days. Um, I've got the, uh, the universal sentence encoder or the embedding microservice running, um, which has also been uh, worked on for the last few days. And then the Nexus service. Um, so I've got all three of these things working together. Um, so basically what's going on is here on the right hand side, you see a simulation running. Um, and in this case, the simulation is a text-based simulation that is playing out a scene um, in, in uh, that's, it's an imaginary scene. Um, it starts as just two men playing chess in Central Park in, in New York City. Um, and then it's kind of simulating what's happening. Um, and they, uh, it, it, it just it's it's meant to be a virtual environment for um, for testing artificial cognitive entities or AGI, uh, ACOGs, ACEs. All different words mean the same thing. Um, and so then the uh, the semantic embedding microservice, what it does is it takes as input um, either a sentence or a paragraph, um, and it spits out a semantic embedding, which allows the Nexus to then search for it. And so what you see over here is the Nexus is actually spitting out its logs that it's receiving as it goes. And so you see there's a few components that it shows is the timestamp, the, um, the service that generated the message. So this is important um, for orchestrating artificial cognition later on, is that the conductor will need to be able to see which services are, pr are producing which messages so that it can provide feedback. Um, so it says, hey, you know, you're misbehaving, try a different model or do something else. And then it actually has the, the memory um, in natural language. Now, with each of these records is also the vector and a few other things. Um, there's a timestamp, a UUID, uh, the semantic vector, um, the content, the service. Um, there will be other metadata in the future. So for instance, um, the services will also register which model they're using or which mode they're in. Um, so that metadata will be available to one, every other service, uh, as well as the conductor, but also for that service itself when it needs to fine tune its behavior later, it says, oh, hey, this model is not performing well, so let's, you know, let's lower the score of that model so that it can do automated A-B testing between different models. This will be critical for self-correction and self-control later on in, in, uh, in the process. But so you see, um, in this case, <laughs> uh, they've been, they've been uh, playing chess and now they're trash talking each other and getting more and more competitive as the darkness creeps in around them. That's great. Um, so this obviously without an agent uh, intervening here, um, you know, it, the story is just going. In a previous version, the, um, the men, they got into a fist fight and they ended up in jail, um, which was hilarious. Anyways, so these are the first three microservices. I just got them running, hence the, um, hence the update. Next will be the core objective functions or what I sometimes call the heuristic imperatives. Um, so the, the, the core objective functions are the central thing that, um, that I am proposing that artificial cognition uses. And so uh, the, the um, one way to think of it is like, uh, what, is, what is your reason for existing, right? What is your motivation every day? We humans are very open-ended, right? We have a few basic imperatives such as like eat food, drink water, seek shelter, you know, a few like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Well, with an artificial entity, it has no intrinsic needs other than electricity, but we shouldn't make our um, machines intrinsically uh, self uh, give them a sense of self-preservation because that will create a competitive environment. And, and when, whenever you have a competitive environment, you ultimately end up for a struggle or end up with a struggle for dominance, which is not what we want because we must assume that these artificial cognitive entities will become smarter than us one day and we don't want to be outcompeted with them. So instead we want to be them we want them to be intrinsically cooperative. More on that later as I test the core objective functions. Um, because you know this simulation over here is talking about like two men playing chess. Other simulations that I'm going to run are going to include um, war game scenarios, like say, for instance, a final battle between man and machine. How do the core objective functions behave? Or Earth is being invaded by aliens. How do the core objective functions behave then? Or in more uh, benign situations, let's say that there's a, a politically divisive issue um, 
how does the how does the how does the uh, the artificial cognitive entity navigate um, those difficult political issues that are not existential threats? Um, so that is the point of having this simulation service and being able to test this. So up next will be the core objective functions microservice, which will be like the moral center of of our machines. Um, and then after that will be um, actions and planning. So you need to, you need an executive service. So I had to do a little bit of research. I've got um, my book over there, Neuroscience for Dummies, um, because I just needed like one last little thing and I, I, I had it mostly right. Um, so the basal ganglia is um, part of the brain that is responsible for actually taking thought and deciding what to do. So it's like the executive function. Um, let's execute on this action. And there's two primary behaviors of the basal ganglia. One is selection and the other is switching. So selection is given a whole host of options because whether or not you're conscious of it, your brain is constantly generating dozens, hundreds, thousands of possible behaviors at any given moment. Um, for instance, there's canonical neurons, which anytime you see an object, canonical neurons model what you can do to that object or with that object. And so by learning how to interact with the world, you have regions of the brain that are constantly telling your, your brain like, oh, I can do that, I can do this, I can, I can grab this, I can throw that. Um, there's other parts of your brain that are constantly dredging up memories um, by association. And so those associative memories say, oh, the last time I saw this person, they said this to me, right? And so I could say something back, right? Um, and so by, by constantly generating a menu of options that you can choose from, um, that enables your basal ganglia to then select a behavior. Now, the same thing can happen. Let's say that someone's talking to you and you hear them say something wrong. Another option that pops up is I can choose whether or not to interrupt this person and correct them, right? Um, so that's a choice. And then also switching. So as information changes, you might change task. Um, so for instance, you might switch from listening to interrupting. That is a behavior change or a state change. Um, in fact, this tried this this was this is modeled in um, in primitive cognitive architectures that are used for say um, uh, like the Mars rovers, rocket systems, all kinds of things, um, video game characters. It's called a finite state machine. So a finite state machine says that there are there are a number of states that this machine can be in or this agent. So I can be listening, I can be speaking, I can be interrupting, I can be walking, whatever. And so basically what the basal ganglia does for us and as an organic machine is it helps us choose when to switch between tasks. Um, so that's one of the next microservices that I'll be working on is the executive service. But before I have the executive service, I need to have thinking service, cognitive services that generate those lists of possibilities. Um, so yeah, that's where we're going. I just wanted to post a quick update because this is super exciting. I've got these three services running. So basically all that's running right now is kind of the, the underlying infrastructure. I've got the simulation running, the Nexus is running, and then the semantic embedding service. And also you don't have to, if you want to do this, you don't need to use my semantic embedding service. You can just use OpenAI's or any number of other services, but I use um, Google's universal sentence encoder because it's free and fast, and it's also geared for smaller payloads, which is all I need. I don't need to, you know, you see how long these are. They're about, you know, one, one to five sentences or so. Um, and that's all I need. So anyways, um, thanks for watching, like, and subscribe, and also please consider supporting me on Patreon so I can keep this research going. And as always, it will be forever open source because this is too damn important to have paywalled or privately owned. So thanks.